Here we're going to look at a beautiful little result in elementary abstract algebra. But before we do that, let's recall a couple of notions. So the first is that of the subgroup test. So I guess I'm assuming some knowledge of groups in this video. Okay. So let's recall that H is a subgroup of G if and only if for all X, Y in H, X, Y inverse is in H. Okay. Next, I want to recall the first isomorphism theorem. That says, if you've got a homomorphism between two groups, I've called them G1 and G2, then the image of that homomorphism, which I'm calling phi, is isomorphic to G1 mod the kernel of phi. Then let's recall that the kernel is always a normal subgroup, so this right-hand side always makes sense. Next, I want to recall that the circle can be thought of as a sub-object of the complex numbers. And I guess I should say the unit circle here. So I've written that as S1. You can think of that as like the one-dimensional circle. So that can be identified with all complex numbers whose modulus is one. So that ends up giving us just a circle with radius one centered at the origin in the complex plane. That's how you want to think about that. So let's start with a couple of fairly simple claims. The first is that S1, under this identification, is indeed a subgroup of the multiplicative group of non-zero complex numbers. So you can take the complex numbers, extract the number zero, and that forms a group under multiplication where one is the identity. Okay, this is actually pretty easy to check. So let's maybe go ahead and suppose that Z and W are in S1. So notice that means that the modulus of Z is equal to one and the modulus of W is also equal to one. But from here, it's easy to check that the modulus of Z over W is equal to the modulus of Z over the modulus of W, which is equal to one over one, which is one. So that tells us that Z times W inverse, in other words, Z over W, is also an element of S1, given that its modulus is one. That's really all you need to do to check that the unit circle is indeed a subgroup of the multiplicative group of non-zero complex numbers. Next, we'll show that the real numbers mod the integers forms a group isomorphic to the circle. Really, we have to think about this carefully. So let's see how we can do that. Well, I want to define a homomorphism. That homomorphism, I'll call phi, goes from the real numbers onto S1 as it lives inside of this multiplicative group of non-zero complex numbers. So I'll write that like that. So how can we define a map from R to S1? Well, we can define it as follows. We'll take the number X and send it to E to the I 2 pi times X. So it's easy to check that this is a homomorphism. Notice phi of X plus Y is clearly equal to phi of X times phi of y. So our addition on the left-hand side turns into a multiplication on the right-hand side, which is good because addition is our operation on the left, but multiplication is our operation on the right. So we've just checked that this is a homomorphism. But that tells us that S1 is congruent, or I should say isomorphic, to R mod the kernel of phi. And I've cheated a little bit here. Really, the image of phi is isomorphic to R mod the kernel of phi. But this is clearly an onto homomorphism, which I think I said before, and by this double arrow, that kind of indicates that. So really, all we need to do is figure out what the kernel of phi is. So let's notice that that's going to be all real numbers x, such that e to the i 2 pi times x is equal to the number 1. Okay, but let's recall by Euler's formula, we know that e to the i 2 pi x is in fact cosine of 2 pi x, plus i times sine of 2 pi times x. Okay, 
Well, that means that cosine of 2 pi x equals 1, just comparing the real sides of both, real parts of both sides of this equation, and the imaginary part is 0. In other words, sine is 0. But that's the same thing as saying that x is in the integers. Okay, but that means our kernel is equal to just the subgroup of integers. But if we replace this kernel of v with the integers, as we've just shown on this line, we get this claim. Okay, so before we move on to our next example, I wanna think about this geometrically as well. And I can fit that into this little box right here. So this notion of taking r and modding out by z, it's like setting all of the integers equal to themselves or equal to each other, I should say. So if we can think about this as being our real line, and then all of these pink things are the integers. So obviously those are discrete parts of the real line. So I'll write that as a z in pink. Well, this action of modding out by z, like I said, is like identifying all of those pink hatches, which wraps that real line into a circle infinitely many times. So again, all of those integers are equal, and then all of the portions between the integers make up this circle. So we wrap around this circle infinitely many times. Okay, so we've got this nice algebraic description of what's going on here, and a nice geometric description of what's going on here. Now, I wanna get rid of this and we'll look at something a bit higher dimensional. So let's look at a little bit of a higher dimensional example. So instead of taking r mod out the integers, I wanna take the complex numbers additively and mod out the Gaussian inter integers. So that's z adjoin i. So we'll recall that z adjoin i or the Gaussian integers are of the form a plus b i where a and b are integers. So let's maybe get a picture of what's going on here. So we can think about this whole thing right here as being the complex plane. So there's our real axis and there's our imaginary axis. And then we've got this discrete set of lattice points given by these Gaussian integers. So we've got 0 plus 0i, 1 plus 0i, 2 plus 0i, 3 plus 0i, so on and so forth. So we have all of these dots along the real axis. Then furthermore, we've got a bunch of dots along the imaginary axis, like i, 2i, 3i, minus i, minus 2i, minus 3i. Then we have everything in the quadrants as well. So we've got 1 plus i, we have 2 plus i, 3 plus i, 1 plus 2i, 2 plus 2i, 3 plus 2i, and this goes on forever in all of these directions. Okay, but just like we did before, this idea of taking this normal subgroup identifies all of those pink dots. So what does that do? Well, you can think of it like this by zooming in. So let's zoom in just to the following spot. So we've got one, we have i, up here we have one plus i. So all of these numbers right here are in the Gaussian integers. So this is happening infinitely many times as we move across this complex plane. So next, we'll see that this line segment between zero and one will be identified with this line segment between i and one plus i. And why is that? Well, that's because these differ by an element of z adjoin i. They differ by i. And then very similarly, this line segment between 0 and i, this line segment between 1 and 1 plus i, are also identified. And that's because they differ by an element of z adjoin i. They differ by the number 1. So that means we've got this identification. 
And then furthermore, like I said before, all of these corners are going to be identified down to one point. Okay, so let's see what that gives us. So folding this along the yellow line first, or identifying the yellow line first, will give us the following picture. So we'll have these two orange circles at either end, and then this wraps this guy up into a cylinder. So we can think about that yellow line happening in between there like that. Okay, great. Then next, we'll identify the two orange parts, and that's gonna wrap this cylinder into something that looks like a donut. So let's get that picture happening. So there we've got our donut. So now we can think about this orange thing having been identified into that circle, and then this yellow line segment is now wrapped around into a circle going this way. So let's recall before we had R mod Z was a circle, and now we have C mod Gaussian integers is like a torus. So that creates a nice duality between these two cases. Now before we finish, I want to do an example of a calculation in C mod Z adjoin I. This is a fairly simple calculation, but I think it's worth it. So let's take one half plus two thirds I. So that's most definitely an example of an element within C plus, then let's say we have three quarters plus two thirds I. Okay, so if we add the real parts, we've got one half plus three quarters, but that's gonna give us five over four. But five over four is bigger than an integer, so we can move it back to something that's smaller than an integer. So like I said, adding this guy and this guy gives us five fourths. We can subtract off an integer because we're modding out by zi and that gives us one quarter. So I should say that equality is happening within this quotient. Furthermore, two thirds plus two thirds is four thirds but we can subtract off an integer. Really, it's an integer multiple of i, giving us one third i. So that's an example of a calculation happening inside of this quotient group. And that's a good place to stop.